welcome. This is the Olinda Alpha Landfill. Um, the Olinda Alpha Landfill is owned by Orange County Waste and Recycling, and the gas that's collected from this landfill is actually used to run a combined cycle power plant. Um, first, I just want to talk a little bit about the landfill operations themselves. Um, you can see the landfill, it, it completely surrounds us at this point. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of really good numbers, but um, the landfill occupies several hundred acres in Brea, California, um, the far north, northeast part of the city. Um, within the landfill are literally hundreds of individual wells. And these individual wells, you can see as some of the black pipes that come up. Um, these wells are all interconnected through collection pipes. Also, what you don't see is underground, there's miles and miles of trenches. Um, in fact, as I understand it, there's dozens of miles of trenches underground. Um, these trenches contain rock and then perforated piping, and that allows the landfill gases to be collected when it's put under a vacuum. So this whole area behind me is just crisscrossed with horizontal collection pipes underground, um, individual wells that are vertical, and then all the gas that collects is ultimately collected together and drawn out of the landfill through this portion of the system over here. So as all the landfill gas is drawn out of the landfill, it collects together in this one large pipe immediately behind me. Um, first the gas goes through these large scrubbers, so water is sprayed through the gas and a lot of the particulates as well as some of the other liquids are now condensed out. Um, to the right and behind that, um, kind of underneath the big pipe, you can see several compressors. So there's actually three of them. Um, these are the big blowers that actually draw the gas out of the landfill. So these are providing the vacuum at all times. Um, the compressed gas um, then drops below. And as we swing to the left, uh, you can see this big device here that says filter on it. Um, that's actually a, a large cooler. So that's just an air cooler, which then um, you know, lowers the temperature. Um, and then to the left of that is another scrubber. Um, so that scrubs some more of the particulate matter um, and condensate out of the system. And then immediately behind that is a chiller. So that chiller will then um, cool the liquid, uh, or I should really say cool the landfill gas even more. Um, any liquids that are gonna come out, um, you know, as we drop the temperature, are then gonna be collected and further drawn off of the landfill gas. So everything we've seen up until now is really just the first stage of cleanup of the landfill gas. Let's keep in mind at this point that the landfill gas is going to be used directly in gas turbine engines. Uh, it's not going to be used inside a boiler, but directly in the, in the gas turbines. So any impurities in the landfill gas are going to cause some pretty significant problems, um, erosion problems or played out um, chemical problems on the blades themselves and will cause a significant amount of damage. So this landfill gas has to be cleaned up significantly more than say the landfill gas that would have been cleaned up at the Spadra facility. So we're now on the other side. Um, we just saw this same um, chiller from the other side. Um, as we leave the chiller, um, the next thing that we're going to do is go through the first compression stage. Um, there's actually three compressors that are all in parallel to each other. Um, these are going to compress the landfill gas even more. And keep in mind that as we increase the pressure, that also is going to tend to create more condensate. And that's really what we're trying to do here. We're trying to get rid of as much of the liquid up in the system as we can. So we're going to go through these three big compressors. Um, then we're going to go through another cooler. Um, we're going to go through a, another scrubber. Um, so the cooler is going to further increase the density. Um, it's going to get more liquids out of solution. Um, we're going to cool it. We're going to scrub it out. And now we have even cleaner landfill gas. And now we're going to go to the siloxane removal system. So this large set of six tanks here um, is actually siloxane removal. Siloxane is, um, well, various silico, silica um, uh, compounds, if you will. Um, and these compounds um, create a lot of problem within the gas turbines um, or within the boiler itself. So the gas turbines cannot handle any kind of particulate matter and siloxane is actually like a fine powder. So it has to be pulled out of the landfill gas. So that's what these are for. Um, this gets rid of the majority of the siloxane. And then we start moving back towards 
the second stage of compressors. So first we're going to go through that large tank there, um, which is um, basically a, a large demineralizer, we can call it a polisher. Now we end up in the second stage compressor. So this is going to compress the landfill gas even more. Um, that's going to further drive liquids out of the gaseous solution. Um, we're going to send this highly compressed gas now, um, again, through a cooler. Um, it's going to leave that cooler and go through another scrubber. And by the time it leaves that, then the landfill gas is as clean as we're able to get it. And it's now going to go right into the gas turbine engine. So this is just an overview shot of the landfill gas compression and cleanup area. Um, once again, you can see the large pipe coming out of the ground. Um, it first moves towards the right. It goes through an inlet scrubber. It then goes through um, several large compressors or blowers. Um, it then moves up to the top and then starts going to the left again. Um, as it moves back to the left, it's going to go through a um, compressor. I'm sorry, it's going to go through a cooler and then another scrubber, and then behind that is gonna be a chiller, and that takes us to the back left corner of this area. And then we have our gas that's slightly clean now. Now it's gonna go through another compressor, actually it's gonna go through three compressors, which will be the first stage of compression. Um, out, so out of that, um, we'll end up going through another cooler and another scrubber. Um, and then we're gonna continue all the way around to the front right-hand corner, and this is actually the siloxane removal system. So that's where the gas passes through a, a media, basically like a filter media, that traps out the siloxane. Um, it leaves that in the big, large beige tanks behind, um, which are actually polishers. Essentially, they're demineralizers or ion exchangers that removes the majority of the rest of the material. And then finally, as it continues, it goes into the second stage compressor. Um, it leaves the second stage compressor um, and then goes through another cooler, um, another scrubber, and that's as clean as we're gonna get. From there, the landfill gas is gonna discharge into the gas turbine. So the landfill gas, as it leaves the gas handling system, um, actually comes through this yellow pipe that's up to the very top, um, and then it just kind of disappears into the structure. So we'll get a better feel for that when we get closer. Um, but from here, this gives you a very good vantage point of the entire system. Um, so we can see, um, you know, up at the higher elevations, there's actually four air inlets. Um, this particular facility has four identical solar gas turbines. Each one produces about six megawatts of electricity. Um, these gas turbines obviously run on landfill gas, and the landfill gas is mixed with air for the combustion process. Now you can see the air is going to come in at the top, um, through that large screen, and then there's a series of filters inside that first housing. And then you see another housing that contains a bunch of pipes. Um, that's actually chilled water that comes from the plant chiller system, and that's going to actually pre-cool the air prior to being let into the gas turbine engine. Now keep in mind that by pre-cooling the air, um, it's going to increase its density because the temperature is lower. Um, that's going to give you the ability to put a, a lot more gas into the engine and therefore mix it with a lot more air and produce a lot more power. Um, here in Southern California, where the temperature can easily reach 100, 110 degrees all summer long, if we were to try to run that, run this plant just on, um, you know, the air coming in at ambient conditions, the density would be just really low and you might be able to get four and a half or five megawatts out of it. By compressing the gas, um, we're able to put more in, uh, I'm sorry, by compressing the air, um, and then mixing it with the landfill gas, we're able to produce quite a bit more power. Now, that pre-chilled air, if you will, is gonna go into the top of the gas turbine. And the gas turbine is something that's running right now. There's no way we're gonna be able to see the thing. Um, you can look into the other handouts or look on Blackboard to get some photographs and illustrations of the gas turbine. Um, but that large section that looks just like um, a shipping container, um, that's the actual gas turbine engine. That contains the compressor, the combustion chamber, the gas turbine itself, and also the generator. Um, this one would be considered a cold end generator. The electric generators are actually on the far left side. Um, the combustion gases mix and burn in the middle. Um, and then on the discharge side, um, that's gonna be your exhaust that's gonna go into the heat recovery steam generator. Now, if you continue to the right past the gas turbine, um, 
all the way up until the stack, this is partially hidden by the big ammonia tank. Um, the ammonia tank is there for providing ammonia for the SCR system. But behind that, all that ductwork there is actually a whole series of heat exchangers. In fact, you can see a large tank right on the top just before the stack. Um, that's actually one of the steam drums. So what's really going to happen is that the gas is going to come out of the gas turbine engine. Um, it's still going to have a significant temperature, perhaps 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's then going to go through the different heat exchangers, starting with the superheater um, and then into the boiler. Um, there's also going to be an economizer in there and there's going to be a preheater in there, essentially like a feed water heater. So we'll look at those in more detail as we get close. Um, also, I would note that there's the SCR system as well as a carbon monoxide removal system, which we um, you know, just call an oxidation catalyst. Um, so those are actually going to be even before we get to the different heat exchangers that are part of the steam plant. And then also, if you go directly above um, the far back side of the plant, um, you can actually see the turbine and generator. Um, you can see the very back end of the generator right to the left of the far right smokestack. Um, you can barely make out on the kind of between the second and the third smokestack. You can make the top, make out the top of the open feed water heater. And again, we'll get closer here and see some of these in detail. So now let's look a little more closely at the air and gas and exhaust portion of this system. Um, so the first thing we should do is why don't we just look up and we get a closer view of the air handling system. Um, once again, you can see the inlet screens and filters. Um, you can see the pre-cooling area. You see the large cold water pipes that go up. Um, those are providing the chilled water to you know, lower the temperature, increase the density of the air. Um, the air is gonna come across through the large ductwork and then it's gonna come straight down. Um, it then goes into the casing around the gas turbine. Now keep in mind that these gas turbines are running at about 10,000 RPM they're extremely noisy and they're inside a soundproof container. Um, so that's what allows us to film so close. Um, I'm just gonna have you switch to this other gas turbine briefly. Um, we can now see the line that brings in the landfill gas. So the large yellow pipe that we saw in the distance previously, um, we can now see breaks off into each of the individual gas turbines, um, the landfill gas, um, it's going to go through a final filter assembly um, that's going to clean out the gas and hopefully it's very, very pure. Um, now let's just switch back to this side. Um, so as the gas runs through the gas turbine, let's keep in mind that the first thing it'll go through is the air compressor. So the air comes in through the middle here and the compressor section is really right about right behind me. To the left is primarily just the electric generator. Um, you can also see those um, ducts and air inlets at the top. Um, those are just ventilation just to provide some cooling for the casing around the gas turbine. So right behind me then is the compressor. Um, the combustion chamber is going to be right around in here. The turbine is going to be right around over here. And then as we leave the turbine, um, if this was not a combined cycle, then these gases would, you know, go through pollution control and then right out the stack. Here, however, they're going to go through pollution control and then through the heat recovery boiler, um, which they call heat recovery steam generator at this particular plant. So the first thing that we have um, right in here, um, this is the oxidation catalyst. Again, we can't see anything because everything's inside the casing, but that's the oxidation catalyst. Um, here is the SCR system. So um, these big pipes right here in front of us are ammonia pipes. So the ammonia is actually sprayed into the exhaust gas. Um, the actual catalyst is right around here. So the ammonia mixed with exhaust goes through the catalyst. <coughs> and that's going to turn um, you know, the majority of the pollutants back into elemental nitrogen or water of carbon dioxide. So um, as we continue to move through, um, we're now going to get to the various heat exchangers. So the first heat exchanger that we're going to get to is actually the superheater. So the superheater's right in this section here. 
Um, as we continue on, um, then we're going to get to the economizer. So that's going to remove more of the heat from the exhaust gas. Um, next, we're going to go into the boiler itself. So this is very much like the other boilers we've seen or talked about. There's a mud drum at the bottom. There's a steam drum up at the top. Um, the saturated steam is actually going to come out the top and along these pipes that go to our left and go down into the superheater. So, um, you know, we've seen that already. Um, as we continue past the, again, the economizer, the boiler, uh, the last stage that we get to here, um, this is actually just going to be the preheater. So this is essentially a feed water heater, but instead of drawing extraction steam off the turbine, um, we're just gonna let the feed water pass through a heat exchanger here in the final stage before we finally go out the stack. So the exhaust gas now has given up most of its energy. It's down to probably five or 600 degrees Fahrenheit. And then it just goes up the stack and out into the environment. So like all plants, at least here in Southern California, um, emissions have to be monitored continuously by the plant owner operator and sent in real time to South Coast Air Quality Management District. So you can see coming off the very top of the stack, that large black insulated piece of piping or tubing, um, that's the sample lines that come off the exhaust um, right out the top of the stack. Um, this line then um, joins with the other lines from the other stacks. Remember, this is a four unit plant. And the lines go right into this building here. And then we'll just take a quick look inside the building um, you can see the emissions monitoring system. You can see all the sampling lines on the back wall there and all the processors, the computers. Um, each one of these has its own purpose, uh, monitoring for NOx or carbon monoxide or unburned hydrocarbons. And again, sending it all in real time uh, to the powers that be. So now we're gonna talk about the steam power plant portion of this combined cycle. And we'll start with the condensate system. So let's keep in mind that the steam coming out of the turbine um, actually comes out through that large opening above the condenser and comes straight down and it fills up the shell space of the condenser. So this is um, our typical shell and tube device, a surface condenser. The steam passes through the condenser, it condenses over the outside of the tubes and then collects at the bottom. Um, in this particular condenser, the hot well is quite a bit smaller than Spadra. It's just that cylinder that kind of sticks off the bottom of the condenser itself. Now coming out, it goes down into the header, <coughs> pardon me, and then goes into the condensate pumps. Um, so here we have three condensate pumps. Um, the condensate is then pushed out of the condensate pumps and through the piping and eventually it goes over to that feed water heater that we will see or have already seen associated with the exhaust gas system. So the pipes are actually uh, kind of above me here. I'm not gonna kind of follow each pipe, but ultimately the pipes come out over here. And let's note that this is just the very back end of the number one gas turbine. So this is actually the feed water heater portion right here at the back. So as the water leaves the condensate pumps, before it actually goes into the open feed water heater, it's gonna to have to go through the feed water heater. Um, I should say closed feed water heater. Um, here we just call it a feed water preheater. So the water from the condensate pumps is gonna come through these lines directly in front of me and then move into the heat recovery steam generator. This is actually the final stage of the heat recovery steam generator. This is the feed water preheater. Um, the preheated feed water is then going to move in, pick up heat, come out, and then it's going to go up into the open feed water heater. And there, of course, finally into the feed water pumps, back over into the economizer. So we've just seen the feed water as it comes out of the feed water heater, which is really part of the furnace. And that's now going to move into the open feed water heater. So here we see the open feed water heater, also called the deaerator. Um, if we look at the pipe that's at the very top, um, that's actually the feed water inlet 
that comes back from the feed water heater. Now the other line that's coming in to the left at the top, that's going to be the extraction steam line that comes off the turbine. Um, we're not really going to be able to follow that line, it just kind of disappears below the turbine. Um, but then those two mix together, um, we understand how open feed water heaters work, the turbulence is going to drive the non condensable gases, that is the air out of solution, and hopefully we have nice pure liquid feed water is now going to collect in the bottom of the feed water heater. And then as you even pan down below, you can see the discharge pipe from the feed water heater. This is now going to go directly into the feed water pumps, which are directly below. And then from there over to the economizer and into the boiler. So we can see the open feed water heater up on top. Um, that large pipe directly below the feed water heater is going to be going first into the feed water pumps. So we can see that we've got three feed water pumps right here in the foreground. And then that compresses the feed water and actually sends it back over towards the heat recovery steam generator. So you can see the pipes. Um, the pipes are going to come out of the feed water pump. Um, they're going to move across. And then they're going to move overhead. And eventually these pipes are going to lead directly into the economizer section of the heat recovery boiler. So the feed water that comes out of the feed water pumps is now going to be redirected to the heat recovery steam generator. So the first thing that we do is go through the economizer. So the economizer section would be immediately behind me. Again, the heat exchanger is on the inside. You can't really see anything but the insulated casing on the outside. Now, the discharge from the economizer is then going to go into the boiler itself. So, directly behind me, behind this console, um, this is the actual boiler section. So, there's this uh, mud drum down at the bottom. Um, the steam drum is up at the top. And in between are a series of riser tubes, just like we would see in any other typical O-type boiler. Um, the steam that collects at the top um, is going to be a two-phase mixture, but in the steam drum, the vapor portion, the saturated vapor, having a lower density, rises to the top. So the steam is then drawn off the top and then moves over to the right. And now this is going to go into the superheater section. So the superheater section is then right in here and the steam that's created in the superheater is a superheated steam and then that too is just going to get collected up at the top um, it's really hard to follow the pipes um, the pipes ultimately move around here and you can see just the very end of the steam collection piping up there at the very top that's just going to move across the structure and eventually into the turbine So the steam piping is immediately behind me. This is the main steam that comes off the superheater. Um, the steam is going to pass through this pipe. Um, this is just a big shutoff valve. It's going to go through the controls and ultimately into the steam turbine. So this is a steam turbine, again, about 8, 10 megawatts, somewhere in that range. Um, as the steam moves through the steam turbine, it's going to obviously give off its energy and drop down into the condenser, which is directly below us. I'm continuing out from the steam turbine, though. The shaft is first going to go through the coupling and gearbox. And that's going to bring it up to 3,600 RPM. Um, and then it's going to go into the electric generator. The generator doesn't look like much. It's just that big gray housing. Um, but that's the electric generator for the steam portion of this power plant. So this is just showing the steam turbine from the other side. Um, you can see the main steam line that comes in from behind, comes towards us. Um, the steam is now going to come in through the controller. Um, you can see, very much like we saw at Spadra, this is a large pneumatic, I'm sorry, a large hydraulic control system. Um, you can see a whole series of plungers, or if you will, piston cylinder devices, as well as that big lever arm up top, and that's going to open and close the main steam inlet valve. Um, so this just gives you a different perspective on the steam turbine system. As we continue moving to the left, well then again, you can actually see the steam turbine. And then you see some of the pipes in the front here. 
I can't tell you exactly which one is which, but one of these is the actual extraction steam that's coming off that's ultimately going to the open feed water heater. And then lastly, we can see the coupling, and the gearbox, and the electric generator here on the end from this side. So this gives us a very good overview of the cooling water system, specifically the cooling tower. Um, clearly, this is a wet cooling tower. It's a mechanical draft cooling tower. Um, you can see the water that's dripping down through the packing of the cooling tower and then collecting in the reservoir below. Um, at the top of the cooling tower, um, we can actually see where the collection basin is. Um, and then off the very top, you can see the fans. Well, you can't really see the fan blades. You're seeing the fan housings. So this is a three cell cooling tower since there's three fans and three sets of packing. Um, the water that ultimately gets cooled from this cooling tower um, is going to come out through the blue pipes in the bottom, through the cooling water pumps, and eventually get pumped on over into the condenser. So I'm underneath the cooling towers here at Olinda. Um, the water that's been heated up in the condenser, the warmer cooling water, is actually going to come back through underground piping, and the underground piping um, comes up here and goes all the way up to the very top of the cooling tower. Now let's keep in mind that as we saw this at Spadra, the piping was on the other side, um, was outside the cooling tower. Um, this is a slightly different cooling tower. It looks very similar from the outside, but this is actually a cross-flow cooling tower. Um, we have the packing that goes all the way up to the top on both the front side as well as the back side of the cooling tower but in between is a large void, a large open space. So what's happening is that the cooling water is actually dripping down through the packing. The air is blowing in perpendicular to that. Um, the water is cooling down, the air is heating up and gaining moisture. That warmer moisture air then moves into the center of the cooling tower, roughly in this section here, where then goes into the fans and out into the environment. Now the cool water that drips down ultimately collects within the basin and the collection basin is just right here at the bottom um, and then you can see that there's the blue pipe the blue pipe is going to collect the cold water and run it through um, what in this case are three separate cooling water pumps and then that water combines into one pipe and then that pipe is going to collect together um, right here next to me again and go back down into the ground and go over to the condenser. Now this particular plant has two condensers and let me explain those to you. So the cooling water that's collected at the bottom of the cooling tower goes through the cooling water pumps and eventually gets sent over here into the main condenser. So the water goes in the bottom through the blue piping. Um, this is a two-pass condenser so the cooling water goes all the way to the end, reverses itself, comes all the way back in this direction, goes into the top portion of the divided water box, which is directly behind me, and then the warmer cooling water comes out the top through that blue pipe. Now, this particular plant is unique in that it actually has a secondary condenser, which is over here to my left, <laughs> and the secondary condenser is what we call a dump condenser. Now, let's keep in mind that there will be situations when the gas turbines are running but the steam plant might be down for maintenance. Um, this is not uncommon. Um, you have to have some way to get rid of the heat that's moving through the heat recovery steam generator. And if you don't have steam to go to a turbine because the turbine system is shut down, well, what do you do with all that steam? So that's what the dump condenser is for. The steam that would be generated by the heat recovery steam generator wouldn't just be dumped into the atmosphere. It would actually be redirected into this dump condenser um, you can see the cooling water lines which are hooked up to the same cooling tower we just saw. Um, the cooling water will then, condense, will then condense the steam back into condensate and then we'll send it right back over into the condensate pumps just like you would if we were using the main condenser. So like all steam power plants we need to make sure that the water is very clear and this is a very modern purification system. So right here behind me, um, these are two RO systems. So these both provide reverse osmosis to clean up the water. 
and then adjacent on both sides, um, these are two different demineralizer beds. So I don't know exactly which is which, um, but one is likely a cation bed, the other is an anion bed. Um, those are going to then absorb any of the other charged particles out of the water. So after going through RO, and then after going through the demineralizers, we have very well purified water, and then that water is going to be stored in a, purifi in a purified water tank that's elsewhere on site. So in this particular plant, there's a chilled water system. One of its main purposes, of course, is to pre-cool the air that's being used within the gas turbine engine. So we actually create chilled water through chillers. Um, these are vapor compression refrigeration cycles. Inside the building behind me, there's actually two large chillers. Now, the water that's being chilled is going to come out through one of these pipes here. It's going to go over into the plant. Um, of course, as it cools down the air, or other purposes, um, it's going to pick up heat. So the warmer chilled water is going to come back through the other insulated pipe down here and go back into the chiller. Now let's also keep in mind that chillers have to have a way of rejecting their heat into the environment. Um, that is done through these cooling water pipes. Okay? So the cooling water is going to go into the chiller. Um, it's going to pick up that heat. Um, the warm cooling water is going to come out through the other blue pipe and is going to go right back into a cooling tower. Now please note that this is a separate cooling tower than the one that's used for the steam power plant. The larger cooling tower to the right is the steam power plant's cooling tower. The smaller cooling tower here to the left is the chiller's cooling tower. So now what I would like to do is just explain briefly how a vapor compression refrigeration cycle works. Um, I think I'm going to do it out here. It's very noisy inside that building. We'll take a look inside the building here shortly. Let's keep in mind that there's three main components. There's the evaporator, the condenser, and the compressor. So the heat that's being pulled off of the plant equipment, um, again, in this case, it's for the air pre-cooling, um, that heat has to be given up somewhere, so it actually gets sent through what's called the evaporator. Um, the evaporator um, is going to actually exchange heat between what would be relatively warmer chilled water and the cold refrigerant. So that refrigerant picks up heat and evaporates. That's why it's called an evaporator. That evaporated refrigerant then gets compressed to a high pressure um, and high temperature. And that temperature is even higher now than the temperature in the environment. So that compressor discharges into the condenser portion. Now, in the condenser, the refrigerant gives up its heat to the cooling water through these blue pipes, right? Um, so as it gives up its heat, the cooling water gets warmer. It goes over into the cooling tower to give up its heat. Um, the refrigerant, of course, gets cooler. Um, the refrigerant cools to the point where it condenses. So the refrigerant condenses, and then it just drips right back down through a throttle, sometimes called an expansion valve, right back into the evaporator, and the cycle goes all over again. So here's the chiller from the inside of the building. Um, first we can see the evaporator. This is the large heat exchanger in the foreground near the bottom. Uh, as the evaporator evaporates the refrigerant, um, it then compresses it. So directly above the evaporator is going to be the compressor. Um, you can see how large the compressor is here. Um, now let's keep in mind that there's actually two chillers here. Um, we can't see the condenser very well because it's behind the evaporator. So um, let's just kind of switch over to the other. In fact, we can see now the condenser very clearly as well as the compressor very clearly. Um, the compressor compresses the gas down into the condenser. The condenser is this large heat exchanger in the foreground. And directly in front of that is something uh, called an economizer, and we're not really going to talk about that right here. Um, the condenser for this unit is behind, I'm sorry, right in front of you. The evaporator is now behind the condenser, and again, you can't really see it very well but at least this gives you a good feel for all the components um, within a typical chiller. All right, well, we're actually inside the control room now at the Olinda Alpha Power Plant. I'm here with one of the plant operators, uh, Jerry Gallegos, and he is going to tell us a little bit about the various control systems that they have here in the plant. So this control system is ran by uh, Rockwell Automation. Uh, everything is automated. Um, this is our main overview screen here. It shows me 
uh, where the gas comes in at what pressures and temperatures. It gets boosted up into our first stage compressor, which you guys have uh, seen outside, and it gets refined into our siloxane skid. Then it gets boosted into our second stage compressor, which goes into our um, gas compressors. In between this also, we do have after coolers that cools down the gas to drop out any non-condensable liquids. Um, I could select, as I said, everything is automated. We will get an alarm sounding here and a description of the alarm uh, to make adjustments accordingly. But if I wanted to go to my first stage compressor, I could just select that and it'll tell me um, my discharge pressures, my temperatures, if I have any kind of alarms set or not, uh, if I'm um, within running parameters. Um, if I needed to go and open and close a the valve, then um, I could go to my siloxane skid, select um, each screen, allows me to open another screen, and then I could open and close the valves here accordingly as needed. And then you can do all the same thing on the power plant equipment too, right? On the power plant equipment as well. Um, if I wanted to go up here to my gas turbines, I could look at the back end of them and see how much, uh, what kind of pressures and temperatures in regards to steam I'm putting out. And uh, I have access to pretty much every piece of equipment. I could go to my train chillers, um, my steam turbine generator, and I could go ahead and go into, you know, my turning gear. I could go into my ammonia um, control system, which is for continuous uh, emissions monitoring system. And I can control the output of the amount of ammonia going into our uh, stacks, which is monitored by AQMD to assure that we're in compliance. And then this plant has um, the carbon monoxide oxidation catalyst and also the SCR, right? The, that is correct, the, and yes. SCR is what the ammonia is used for. So back here we have that, that is correct. So we'll have our NOx catalyst right here. Uh, we have a bed guard, CO catalyst, and then we have our NOx catalyst. And obviously our things, you know, the um, exhaust from the gas turbine goes through those to create the, the steam, as well as uh, making sure that we're in compliance of what we put up the stacks. But do you know how much NOx you usually get from this facility? Uh, do you know that by any chance, Mo? A day? Um... We are below 72 MMBTU, so that's the heat value. So it's, we have an average of 25 ppm per hour, less than 25, which is the permit. Okay. So you would multiply that times 24 to give you your total. Okay, so we're, we're talking about like less than 25 parts per million of NOx. Per hour. Definitely. Right now it's yeah. about 19.4. Okay. Yeah. Um, so usually you can keep it pretty well below the set point definitely and, and that's yeah. all being according you know to our set point of how much ammonia we're going to be putting in to knock down that NOx. and then i understand that there's also a plant information system is that something you could show us briefly yeah definitely so we do have a pie system that we use okay. uh, that will show us um didn't different parameters and where we're running so if we have it's a pretty much a tool we use to troubleshoot Okay. Uh, to find out if a plant trips or we have some kind of abnormal um, operational condition, then we could go to our pie screen here and it'll show us uh, for different pieces of equipment uh, what, we're, what we're showing at that time. So I could show here our siloxane train A heater temperature uh, is the white line. This is where it's kind of off and then all of a sudden our heater is kicking on and it comes to full temperature. This heater is utilized to regenerate the beds in the siloxane skid, and that's uh, how we refine the gas. Um, the bed will regen for about 20 hours, it'll heat it up, and then it'll depressurize it, cool it down, and then that's when it's ready to go ahead and regen and place into production and to uh, knock out any siloxanes and get clean gas. Okay. And then this will give you not only real-time data, but it also stores historical data, right? That is so correct. So you can write reports, you can look for trends. I mean, I assume that you can monitor like There's vibrations. There's a lot of different flow. things. Yeah, Pi is very, very useful for us, uh, especially with our engineer on site. Um, any changes can changes in reports can be found on Pi. Any abnormal conditions. Okay. And then one last thing I wanted to know is that they also have cameras all over the site so you can see from the first screen they can keep an eye on things 
in real time, you know, make sure that everybody's following the rules. Um, you know, if there's any smoke coming out of something or any upset conditions, they start seeing water collecting on the ground somewhere, um, then they know that something's amiss and, um, you know, they can look all over the plant for, for these kind of potential problems. Yeah, we're a 24 seven operation on nights and weekends. There's only two operators here on site and we are actually on Orange County Landfills property, therefore there's no fences or any fence lines coming in. So the cameras is a great way to see any kind of operational abnormalities and or to you know keep ourselves secure here at, at our plant. But uh, everything is real time and we can store and go back. Uh, this uh, data is stored and recorded. So we could you know go back and see who's on site at a certain time if we see a suspicious car and or if there's some kind of abnormal you know, uh, abnormality in, in regards to operations and we could go back and see. Definitely. Well, thank you very, very much.